Whenever we think about genetics, most of us probably worry about words like these and wonder if we understand them correctly or not. The list of specialist genetic words is very long and extremely daunting. If I explained these terms to you and more, I probably wouldn't tell you much of immediate value to the practical beekeeper who wants to improve their stock. Besides, most of these terms are now about a hundred years old. Genetic understanding has undergone a revolution in recent decades, and we have more important things to focus on nowadays. I will make passing reference to the ideas and experiences of Gregor Mendel, but that is all. The structure of this presentation will be as follows. Firstly, I would like to share some very basic reflections about breeds and breeding. Anyone wishing to improve their stock really ought to understand these things. Then I will share with you a truly astonishing revelation about breeds of honeybee. Only then will I remind you of the key features of Mendelian inheritance. My attempt to do this might be quite clumsy, but it really won't matter. Mendelian laws of inheritance are of no true relevance to the bee improver. The rest of the presentation will explain why this is the case. It will go through all the concepts listed here in turn. Each really deserves a separate detailed presentation, and perhaps one day I will create them. By the end of this presentation, you should understand why the bee improvement approaches of these famous beekeepers are not only fundamentally different, but also essentially incompatible. However, I will tackle these ideas properly in a different presentation. OK, so I would like to start by considering a hypothetical natural environment that has not experienced any human intervention. I suspect that most of us would consider such an environment to be populated by many different species of organism that had evolved over billions of years. If we carefully examined any of these species, we would find variety between every studied specimen, and that variety would be indicative of adaptability and health at species level. In different parts of a continent, we might find populations of the same species between which consistent distinctions could be found. This is the basis of subspecies. On a smaller scale, all members of a species in one locality might display subtle differences from those found in a different nearby locality with different environmental features. This is the basis of ecotypes within a species. The characteristics of two different ecotypes might blend into each other over a reasonable distance, and such phenomena are known as clines. A pedigree is quite simply an accurate documentary list of parentage over many generations. There are no such things as pedigrees in natural environments where humans have not interfered in the natural mating behaviours of wild animals. The level of identifiable variety at species level is so great that it even calls the very concept of species into doubt. There is a long-running academic and philosophical debate on this subject that shows no sign of reaching a satisfactory conclusion. Now consider an environment subject to considerable human intervention, such as a farm. Here you will encounter breeds each developed over hundreds or even thousands of years. Uniformity within the population and between generations indicates purity of breed. Subclassification might be possible into the breeding lines maintained by different breeders. Ecotypes and clines do not exist. On the other hand, pedigrees are essential if a pure breed is to be maintained. Let's look at some examples. A long time ago, we took the grey wolf. We turned it into this. A poodle is one of over 200 breeds of animal derived from the grey wolf. It might be cute and fluffy, but at heart it is a very altered wolf. Once in a while, 
the wolf can make a sudden and unexpected reappearance in the dog, sometimes with devastating consequences. Poodles can only be bred with other poodles if their offspring are also going to be poodles. Poodles, and indeed all pedigree breeds of dog, are closed and highly inbred subpopulations of wolf. As another example, we took the auroch and exploited it for its meat and milk production qualities. In fact, we exploited and neglected it so much that it went extinct in 1627. Its legacy today comprises over 800 breeds of pedigree cow. This painting is from the early 19th century, when it was fashionable for rich landowners to show off their breeds of farm livestock. The Eurasian wild boar was bred and became the pig. Again, this painting is from the early 19th century. The majestic mouflong served as blueprint for over 370 recognised pedigree breeds of sheep. As you well know, different breeds of sheep have been specifically developed to cope with very different and sometimes extreme environmental conditions. And you should see what we have done to the pigeon during a relationship that extends over about 10,000 years. We have created breeds with completely different body shape and completely different plumage, often in combination. A complete list of the animals we have bred would be truly eye-boggling. All breeds display deliberate and very evident alterations of the original traits of the index species. To create them, breeders must maintain closed populations and exert complete control over every mating partnership. However, closed populations become inbred and this always creates problems. Let's turn to the dog again. Some breeds were specifically bred to perform single but highly specialised tasks with great skill. Others were bred to endure particular environments. One might imagine that certain others were bred simply to look nice. However, every breed is an example of human domination over the natural environment. Unfortunately, many breeds of dog are highly predisposed to genetically determined problems that are a direct consequence of the inbreeding required to create them. Some examples are given here. Astonishingly, humans created innumerable breeds of animal over thousands of years without knowing the principles that lay behind their breeding successes. In fact, one might be forgiven for thinking that breeds originated as an inadvertent consequence of repeated inbreeding of limited stock by small and isolated communities. There must have been innumerable inbreeding failures for every recognised breed that exists today. Even more astonishingly, humankind has exploited one animal for over 12,000 years, but has failed to create a breed from it. That animal is the honeybee. There are good genetic reasons why there has never been a breed of honeybee. Sure, in the last hundred years or so, there have been bee breeders who have controlled which drone bees have mated with which queen bees over multiple generations. But these bee breeders have only ever created strains rather than breeds. There have been many attempts to create superior breeds of honeybee. The attempts of this man are particularly noteworthy and perhaps even surprising. He was recognised in his day for his successful hive designs and he must have been one of the first Europeans to adopt many of Langstroth's innovations. However, his bee improvement attempts were a failure his honeybee stock even became so aggressive that he was required to remove it from the monastery where he lived. Interestingly, he had been given this small garden plot a few years earlier. 
he used it to grow common pea plants in their thousands, meticulously pollinating them by hand and carefully noting the traits of every successive generation. This is the first page of his letter describing his findings. Published in 1865, its importance went unrecognised until after his death. Nonetheless, today this man is known as the father of genetics, for he was none other than Gregor Mendel. Just to recap on the key points made so far, humans have been developing breeds such as these long before Mendel had worked out his basic laws of genetic inheritance. And even the father of genetics was unable to develop a breed of honeybee. At this point we should remind ourselves what Mendel had learnt. We will use pea seed colour as an example. Common pea seed can either be green or yellow. There are no other options. When Mendel self-pollinated common pea plants with green seeds, every pea plant in the subsequent generation also had green seeds. When he self-pollinated common pea plants with yellow seeds, sometimes every pea plant in the subsequent generation also had yellow seeds. On other occasions, the subsequent generation yielded a plant with green seeds for approximately every three plants with yellow seeds. Mendel inferred that pea plants obtained instructions for seed colour from both parent plants. He described the dominant and recessive inheritance of discrete traits through sexual reproduction. His model of inheritance only worked for seven discrete traits, each of which comprised a dichotomous choice. It did not work for any other trait many of which were arguably of greater practical significance. A feature common to all these other traits was that they could lie anywhere along a spectrum of options and were measurable. They are therefore known as quantitative traits. The seven discrete traits are controlled by a single gene. All the quantitative traits are controlled by interplay between multiple genes and environmental factors. As an aside, Mendel first started exploring trait inheritance in mice, but was required to stop because it was considered inappropriate to study sex in animals. After publishing his findings with the common pea, he tried to reproduce them with hawkweed. However, the attempt failed. We now know this is because hawkweed can produce seed asexually. It was only then that he turned his attention to the honeybee with such unfortunate outcomes. The rest of this presentation outlines some of the reasons for this failure. Every consideration that follows should be of considerable interest to any beekeeper who wishes to improve their stock today. First, we should note that a small number of honeybee traits are controlled by single genes. It would seem reasonable for these to follow Mendelian patterns of inheritance, but this rarely happens. We only know of these single gene traits because of visually striking aberrations that are seen very rarely in individual colony members. For example, here is a picture of a white-eyed drone that I found in one of my colonies in 2018. I assume the worker bees knew that something was wrong with it and had nibbled its wings. Every single gene trait that we know about can be considered an abnormality. They crop up as spontaneous mutations in about one in a million bees. And for reasons that will be explained shortly, they are much more common in drone bees. The drones concerned are placed at considerable competitive disadvantage and fail to mate. Therefore, these spontaneously appearing mutational traits go extinct again with the death of the drone. Only one such trait is considered valuable, and that is as a research tool. So, if nearly all honeybee traits are not determined by single genes, 
What are they determined by? The answer is quantitative trait loci. A trait is simply another word for a characteristic. A quantitative trait is one that can exist anywhere along a measurable spectrum rather than being discrete. A locus is the specific position on a specific chromosome where a specific gene is always positioned. Quantitative trait loci can be defined as all the genes that are collectively responsible for determining a quantitative trait. As B improvers, we are interested in properties such as these. Let's unpack gentle behaviour a bit more. Here are some of the properties that I want to see in my bees. In my main apiary, with 10 or more hives, my children can bounce all day on a trampoline just 3 metres from the nearest hive. At home, I have a hive immediately outside my patio doors, and my children and I regularly walk through the flight line, just a metre from the hive entrance, without disturbing the bees in the slightest. I won't tolerate colonies that instantly try to sting me when I inspect them, or that angrily follow me down the road afterwards. Sure, once in a while my bees are a bit defensive for some reason or other, but I want them to rapidly calm down as soon as the hive roof goes back on. Is it reasonable to expect so many complex and interacting properties to be defined by a single gene? Of course not. There is good scientific evidence that these behaviours are controlled by multiple gene expression. If we were to inspect a hundred colonies, we would soon understand that the guarding and stinging behaviours of individual colonies fall somewhere along a spectrum of possible behaviours. Furthermore, we would discover that most colonies are pretty similar in these traits. We would also discover that really gentle colonies and really angry colonies are much less common than colonies with average behaviour. It is the same for foraging behaviour and hygienic behaviour. I suspect that the deeper we look at these things, the more complex we will discover the interplay of multiple genes to be in the expression of all the traits that we are interested in as beekeepers. This has very important consequences that we have no choice but to accept. Firstly, no bee improver can engineer stock that expresses the most desirable allele from the perspective of the bee improver at every locus. There will always be an element of chance regarding which allele is expressed at each relevant locus. Secondly, for mathematical reasons, the expression of any trait within the entire population of honeybee colonies will always and unavoidably follow a normal distribution curve. About two in three colonies in the whole population will be more or less average for the trait in question. About two in every 15 colonies might be considered good. About one in 50 colonies might be considered excellent. And perhaps one in 250 colonies might be considered outstanding. Likewise, about two in every 15 colonies might be considered bad, one in 50 might be considered really poor, and one in 250 colonies might be considered awful for the trait in question. Thirdly, B improvers are interested in multiple traits, each of which will follow its own normal distribution of expression within the entire population. The more traits we are interested in, the less likely we are to find colonies that are better than average in all of them. As will become evident in the next section, any strenuous attempt by the beekeeper to alter the expression of some alleles at the expense of others will ultimately damage the stock. The first reasonably contemporary genetic lesson to take on board is this. Quantitative traits rely upon multiple gene expression and they cannot be viewed in simple Mendelian terms. If you wish to explore this idea in greater detail, 
then I cannot recommend this book highly enough. It looks at the genetic basis of pollen hoarding. Whilst it can be a tough read in places, it is well worth the effort. I would now like to turn my attention to the genetic consequences of polyandry. Poly means many and andry means male. Therefore, polyandry simply means many males. Hopefully, you will have encountered this book at some point during your interest in honeybees. Whilst old, it is undoubtedly a classic. Ribbons was something of an encyclopedist, and in slightly over 310 pages, he presented a highly referenced digest of cutting-edge scientific understanding of the honeybee in 1953. It is still worth reading today, and much of it is as relevant now as it was then. However, we could not say that about chapter 18, mating behaviour. For example, the first quote indicates that the scientific community was sceptical about the notion of drone congregation areas. Likewise, the second quote promotes the idea that honeybees mate in the missionary position in locations amenable to human voyeurism. However, it is the third quote that I want to draw your attention to. It was considered that queen bees mated with just one drone on a mating flight, and that a queen bee mated with just one or two drones. This book will bring you right up to date with honeybee mating biology and should definitely feature on the bookshelf of anyone interested in the subject. We now know that queen bees mate with many drones, with 15 being a representative number. They do so by flying to aerial locations where perhaps 20,000 drones have already congregated, orbiting through a virtual epicentre in anticipation of her arrival. Such a congregation area might have drone representation from as many as 200 nearby colonies. The queen flies through this cloud of drones and is serially mated at approximately 15 second intervals. On the one hand, each drone must be strong and fit enough to fend off the competition if it is to successfully mate. On the other hand, each drone must be fortunate enough to be at the correct point of its orbit if it is to successfully mate. This mating arrangement combines considerable competition with considerable luck and optimises the mixing of successful combinations of locally sourced DNA. The beekeeper is interested in the traits of a colony rather than those of individual honeybees. Every worker bee in the colony has developed from an egg that has been fertilised with a sperm from a single father, but the queen stores sperm from somewhere in the region of 15 fathers. At colony level, there are as many genetically distinct worker bee subfamilies as the number of drones the queen bee mated with. Colony level traits are quite clearly an amalgam of the quantitative traits of multiple subfamilies. The combined impact of multiple quantitative traits of multiple subfamilies quite obviously defies simple Mendelian rules of inheritance. Next, we will consider the concept of genetic recombination in the honeybee. Every cell in the queen bee contains a nucleus with two complete sets of genetic code, one derived from her mother and the other from her father. Each set of genetic code comprises 16 chromosomes. Any organism with two sets of genetic code in its nucleus is diploid. However, the nuclei in her unfertilized eggs contain just one complete set of genetic code. They are haploid. This allows a haploid egg fertilized by a haploid sperm to become diploid again. Diploid germ cells are converted into haploid eggs by meiosis. It is a very complicated multi-step process. As a beekeeper, all you need to know about it is this. During meiosis, 
genetic material is exchanged between both sets of chromosomes in a manner that we can essentially consider random. Therefore, each egg contains some DNA from the queen's mother and some DNA from her father. Let's illustrate this by considering what happens to the chromosome 1 pair during meiosis. One of those chromosomes came from the queen's mother. The other chromosome came from the queen's father. However, the chromosome 1 that the queen passes on in her own eggs contains a mixture of genetic material from both of her parents. This is genetic recombination. The exact combination of genetic material from each parent will be different in every egg she ever produces. No other animal studied employs genetic recombination to the same extent as the honeybee. The resolution of genetic recombination is 20 times finer in honeybees than in humans. When we consider the combined effect of genetic recombination and the random but highly competitive nature of the polyandrous mating system of the honeybee, we are instantly struck by the following. No other terrestrial animal goes to such length to mix up its DNA and share it amongst the entire local population. We have now considered all the factors that create intracolony genetic diversity. Now we must understand the profound range of things that honeybee genes code for. None of us struggle with the idea that they code for all physical aspects of the honeybee, as well as all the chemical pathways necessary for life. We see this most strikingly in the shape and colour of the bees in our hives. Sometimes it is easy to see considerable variation between workers from different patrolines. What might be a bit harder to conceptualise is that honeybee DNA also codes for behaviour in some considerable detail. For example, the very first thing newly emerged adult honeybees do is turn around, re-enter the cell they just came out of and clean it. They weren't taught how to do this. Instead, the behaviour was coded into their DNA. Likewise, worker bees are not taught how to communicate via the waggle dance or how to understand it. Once again, this information is hardwired into their DNA. The same can be said of any task performed by any worker bee, either inside or outside the nest. There might be some variability in the genetic code that describes certain behaviours. But it doesn't stop there. Individual worker bees are genetically programmed to perform particular tasks when stimuli in their immediate environment cross certain thresholds. The threshold criteria are genetically defined and they are different for each worker bee. This has some very important consequences. Firstly, as environmental parameters start to drift from their optimal levels from the perspective of the colony, only a small number of worker bees respond to that change by performing the relevant restorative behaviours that are programmed into them. Secondly, as the environmental parameters in question drift further from their desired points, more worker bees get taken beyond their individual thresholds for triggering a behavioural response. This arrangement results in a finely graduated colony level response that remains proportionate to the size of any environmental cue. Alongside this arrangement, worker bees can employ recruitment behaviours. Thirdly, if every worker bee has a slightly different behavioural profile written into its DNA, it is evident that each will have different degrees of specialism for various tasks. It doesn't pay for every worker bee to be a specialist at every task. Division of labour works better. Even if your bees have not read your bee books, they have read Adam Smith and taken his ideas to heart. Over recent years, 
overwhelming evidence supports the idea that honeybee colonies with high genetic diversity are healthier, more productive and less susceptible to disease. However, this only applies if the genes being expressed are suited to the environment in which the colony lives. Our next take home message is this. Well adapted genetic diversity is important to the honey bee colony. If you want a better understanding of the wide range of worker tasks and how they are allocated, then there is no better introduction than this book. What do we mean by well adapted genetic diversity? This is the question we turn to next. In very simple terms, you will remember that specific genes are located at specific loci on chromosomes. However, there are several coding options for each gene, with each coding option being called an allele. Some alleles suit the environment better than others. We can conveniently classify alleles as being either beneficial, neutral, maladaptive or fatal. Let's deal with fatal alleles first. When expressed, these result in the death of the individual bee. My white-eyed drone was an example of a honeybee expressing a fatal allele. It would have been blind and therefore unable to mate. The fatal allele would have become extinct with the death of that drone until the next time it made a spontaneous reappearance somewhere within the drone pool. Every time it appeared, it would suffer the same fate. Moving on to neutral alleles. Alleles of the complementary sex determiner gene are neutral. We will consider these later. Neutral alleles neither confer a competitive advantage or a competitive disadvantage, and they tend to be perpetuated in the population at steady levels. Now. Let's think about beneficial and maladaptive alleles. Colonies expressing the former are at a competitive advantage compared to those expressing the latter, and all other factors being equal, they are more likely to succeed and to reproduce. Therefore, beneficial alleles become perpetuated at high levels within the local population, whereas the proportion of the maladaptive alleles falls. Perhaps an example would help. Hygienic behaviour is beneficial to colonies in areas with high levels of American fowl brood. In fact, it is likely that colonies without hygienic behaviour will die if AFB becomes endemic in their area. However, all that uncapping of suspicious smelling brood and removal of the cell contents diverts worker bees from other duties. It also reduces the number of new workers that can emerge each day. Furthermore, considerable nutrition is wasted in the sacrificed brood. This helpful behaviour is not without cost. Therefore, it would not be unreasonable to say that hygienic behaviour is maladaptive in the absence of brood disease. When, in the 1960s, Rothenbuhler demonstrated hygienic behaviour to be genetically determined, he also provided the very first example of a multi-gene trait. It has been suggested that perhaps 10% of all colonies express hygienic behaviour. We might view this as the background prevalence for genetic expression of this trait. Rothenbuhler showed that even when all the stock in an area displayed hygienic behaviour, only about 33% of the next generation of colonies displayed that same trait. It lies comparatively dormant within the population genome to be drawn out whenever environmental circumstances dictate. More recently, Marla Spivak anticipated which colonies could have AFB resistant hygienic behaviour drawn out of them and which ones could not.
Hygienic behaviour should also be beneficial to honeybee colonies with Varroa, which these days applies to almost all colonies except those on a small number of isolated islands. One might expect a high proportion of the national stock to display hygienic behaviour. However, this situation changes considerably if the national stock is regularly treated for Varroa. In this situation, alleles coding for hygienic behaviour become neutral and their prevalence does not increase. This is an example of anthropogenic selection pressure, which we will consider in a bit more detail later. So, to recap, in any environment, beneficial alleles confer benefit and they increase in prevalence within the population. The converse is true of maladaptive alleles. Neutral alleles neither increase nor decrease in prevalence. Beneficial and maladaptive are relative terms. Just because something that was once beneficial is not beneficial now, does not mean that it will never be beneficial again. Now I would like us to look at the unusual way that honeybee gender is determined and to consider a personal hypothesis as to why it is structured like this. You already know that queen bees are diploid, so are worker bees. However, drone bees are haploid. Every sperm produced by an individual drone bee is identical you can view drones as nothing more than very ingenious vehicles that deliver large packets of monoclonal queen bee sperm to aerial mating sites. Whilst they are well-groomed, supremely athletic, equipped with superior vision and so forth, as soon as they have successfully mated, they die. Alternatively, as soon as the colony no longer needs them, they are evicted and left to die. Now, the honeybee genome is a bit strange in that parts of it seem to exclusively code for queen bees, other parts exclusively code for worker bees, and yet other parts exclusively code for drone bees. However, much of it must surely code for all three types of honeybee. In a haploid drone, for every gene that needs to be expressed, there is no place for a fatal allele to hide. This serves as a great device for flushing fatal alleles out of the gene pool. In contrast, if fatal recessive alleles can find their way into a queen bee, their presence can be hidden by the allele on the complementary chromosome. Theoretically, these can be perpetuated at low levels within a population. It might seem self-evident that fertilised eggs produce queen and worker bees, whereas unfertilised eggs produce drones. However, this is not quite the whole story, as was discovered by the man who found out why blocks of healthy brood contain occasional empty cells. These empty cells start off containing fertilised eggs. However, when they hatch, the worker bees eat the larvae. If carefully protected from cannibalism, these larvae would have become diploid drones. Honeybee gender is dictated by the complementary sex determiner gene, which has about 150 alleles. Any larvae heterozygous for the CSD gene, in other words they contain two different CSD alleles, become female honeybees and all such bees must be diploid. Any larvae homozygous for the CSD gene, in other words they contain only one CSD allele, become male honeybees. However diploid males are eaten before they develop only haploid males reach maturity. Sex determination by the CSD gene places inbred colonies at a distinct survival disadvantage. A small and genetically isolated honeybee population 
will start off with a limited number of CSD alleles in its gene pool, and there is no way for this number to increase. However, simple probability dictates that from time to time, a CSD allele will fail to make it into the next generation. Over time, the number of CSD alleles in the population can only fall. As this happens, the proportion of fertilized eggs homozygous for the CSD gene will increase. Mathematics dictates that at its most extreme, half the fertilized eggs will be cannibalized when they turn into larvae. Such a colony might limp along in the absence of any other competition, but it will fail spectacularly if non-inbred colonies move into the area, and this is the right thing to happen in the wild. The main learning points from all this are as follows. Haploid drone bees can filter many fatal alleles out of the gene pool. The CSD gene places inbred colonies at a distinct survival disadvantage. So, we have established that honeybees go to extraordinary lengths to mix up and share the DNA from successful local colonies. We have also seen that too much inbreeding is very harmful. Now we must look at the evidence for outbreeding depression or the detrimental impacts of DNA from an unnaturally distant location. Whilst you might not have encountered this term before, you will almost certainly have heard beekeepers talking about local adaptation. Essentially, this is the flip side of outbreeding depression. A good place to start is with some classic research from France. During the 1960s, Louvo examined the various ecotypes of Apis mellifera mellifera in France. The Landers ecotype was particularly noteworthy. Landers has two nectar flows each year, one in late May and the other in September. Louvo noted that the Landers ecotype has two worker population surges every year to coincide with the two nectar flows. Paris does not have the same double nectar flow. Over the next few years, Nouveau moved colonies from the outskirts of Paris to Landers and vice versa, and looked at colony performance in the new locations. Colonies moved to Landers did not display the double annual population surge of the local ecotype. They were unable to properly exploit the local forage and they fared less well. Colonies moved from Landers to the outskirts of Paris maintained their double annual worker population surge. This was not suited to the new location. Most notably, the September population surge wasted resources just when colonies should have been preparing for winter. The colonies failed. Louvo crossbred local and imported colonies in Landers. This resulted in a new generation of colonies with intermediate brood cycles that were maladapted to both Landers and Paris. Louvo concluded that both ecotypes had developed genetically determined breeding cycles suited to their own localities. In other words, both ecotypes demonstrated genetically based local adaptation. When the two ecotypes were crossbred, the resultant colonies had a distinct competitive disadvantage. In other words, they demonstrated outbreeding depression. In the 1950s and 1960s, very observant beekeepers in the United Kingdom noted the phenomenon of local adaptation as they compared stock from different parts of the country. They were also very concerned at the damage being done to national stock by outbreeding depression as increasing numbers of imported honeybees came into the country. Prior to the recent revolution in genetic research, much attention was placed upon the geographic distribution of subtle variants of the same enzyme. 
otherwise known as allozymes. This paper from 1994 demonstrated a clear link between the local prevalence of different allozymes and longitude. It appears that different allozymes confer competitive advantage at different average temperatures. This is an example of local adaptation on a global scale. A more recent study compared and contrasted the genome of honeybee colonies from different parts of the world and found evidence of local adaptation at genetic and molecular levels. In 2014, the Journal of Apicultural Research devoted a whole issue to the comparative health and survival of honeybee colonies taken from and placed in different parts of Europe. The consistent finding was that local stock fared better than imported stock. The findings were considered so important that the whole journal has been made openly accessible for all to read. To summarise, there is good evidence that over time honeybees genetically adapt to their local environments. Those colonies with a competitive edge have greater reproductive success and their locally suited alleles become highly distributed within the area. Local adaptation operates over surprisingly small distances. Imported stock can damage the local gene pool. The notion of competitive edge brings us on very nicely to selection pressure. This is all about the factors that make alleles beneficial maladaptive or neutral in a population. Unfortunately, in the 21st century, it is also about outbreeding depression. Let me explain why. Successful brood rearing is dependent upon reliable supplies of nectar and pollen. In a Mediterranean climate, where the flora and ambient temperature allow honeybees to forage almost all year, an absent winter brood break provides competitive advantage at colony level, as does a high egg laying rate during the summer. Likewise, deep in the Balkans, where long harsh winters are followed by the sudden arrival of spring and then a short hot forage season, explosive colony growth and repeated swarming early in the year optimise colony level reproduction and survival into the following year. The native subspecies in both these areas behave as they do for good reason. However, both sets of traits are maladapted to the maritime climate of the UK. Italian stock can starve if it rains for too long in the summer or if it is not fed enough in the build up to winter. Likewise, Swarmy spring colonies from deep within the Balkans make the job of the beekeeper much more demanding than it need be at this time of year. And without syrup supplements, many such swarms would probably not survive. Unfortunately, by feeding such colonies at critical points in their annual life cycle, beekeepers have removed the competitive disadvantage under these artificial conditions, maladaptive alleles have become neutral. Colonies that might have died under more natural conditions have been allowed to thrive. Their virgin queens and drones have mated with local stock, resulting in a mixing of DNA and outbreeding depression at population level. The national stock has been damaged. However, if colonies with maladaptive traits are not fed at key points, then competitive disadvantage reappears and they fare less well. This favours the survival of better environmentally adapted colonies and the proportion of beneficial alleles in the population rises. Historically, honeybees of the British Isles were characterised by being able to fly at lower ambient temperature and in light drizzle. At colony level, they had a low egg laying rate, a winter brood break and a low swarm rate. They were also frugal with their stores.
Such ideas have always been central to the philosophy of the Bee Improvement and Bee Breeders Association, and two prominent beekeepers who pushed these ideas were David Cushman and B.O. Cooper. You cannot avoid selection pressure or the part that you personally play in it. That being the case, it is surely important that you exercise it responsibly. Selection pressure creates genetic bottlenecks. To understand genetic bottlenecks, let's return to the relationship between honeybees and varroa mites. There are parts of the world where wild or feral honeybee populations have remained untreated for many years. The academic world knows of 10 self-sustaining wild populations that are exposed to varroa but have not succumbed to it. These populations are scattered around the world. In addition to these populations, I personally know of a honey farmer nearby who has varroa resistant stock. He has never treated his bees for varroa. Early on, he suffered immense colony losses and his hive numbers fell from 100 to 10. Thankfully, he had other financial income streams to tie him over this setback. Within a small number of seasons, his colony numbers built up again, and for many years he has maintained a hundred hives that he never treats for varroa. Is there any scientific evidence that such a thing is possible? Or is this just a tall story? Well, the experience of my beekeeping friend is nothing out of the ordinary at all. The first study that we should consider took place on a Swedish island where 150 introduced colonies were deliberately contaminated with varroa and left to fend for themselves. This is what happened. Over the following six seasons, the 150 founder colonies dropped to five. Losses were particularly high going into the third season. However, whilst the founder colonies suffered terrible losses, it is important to note that they did not go extinct. Over the first two seasons, 33 swarms issued, but none of these survived. Over the next three seasons, another nine swarms issued. Whilst this study was written up too soon for us to know the long-term fate of these colonies, if one looks at the total number of colonies in the study, it is evident that there was considerable population collapse over a four-year period, followed by a steady level of survivor stock. So that seems to be what happens in the early years. But what happens after that? To answer this question, we can turn to some publications from Tom Seeley, a beekeeping academic with an interest in honeybee ecology. For many years, he has monitored the feral colonies that live in natural tree hollows in Arnott Forest in New York State. By using the traditional skills of the bee hunter, he was able to trace the flight paths of forager bees in different parts of the forest back to their colonies. And from that, he was able to infer the total number of colonies within the forest. He discovered that the forest supported just as many colonies 20 years after Varroa first struck. Furthermore, by comparing the genetic structure of the forest bees and bees from the two closest managed apiaries, he was able to demonstrate that the forest bees were a closed population that was neither repopulated nor cross-mated with bees from outside the forest. In a subsequent study, he compared the genome of worker bees collected from the forest in 1977 and 2010 and made two important findings. Firstly, the mitochondrial DNA profile within the two samples was strikingly different. I have deliberately avoided talking about mitochondrial DNA in this presentation, but I do intend to cover it very carefully in a subsequent one. All I want to say right now 
is that this finding clearly demonstrates that the population of 18 colonies in 1978 collapsed down to one or perhaps two survivor colonies before original colony density was re-established. Whenever a population crash is so spectacular as to leave evidence in the genetic legacy of a species, it does so by removing some aspect of the previous genetic diversity and that sudden loss of genetic diversity is known as a genetic bottleneck. The second thing that Seeley and his team found was that allele diversity in the nuclear DNA was unchanged, but the frequency with which certain alleles were expressed was different. Presumably, different alleles have become adaptive and maladaptive in a Varroa contaminated environment. One would have expected a survivor population derived from just two colonies to have lost nearly all its nuclear genetic diversity. How is it possible for this not to have happened? Presumably genetic recombination, polyandry and all the other remarkable aspects of honeybee mating biology allow the species to bounce back quite quickly from near calamitous insults. The phenomenon by which genetic material exchanges between organisms and throughout populations is known as gene flow. Another study examined the DNA profiles of honeybees sampled from around the world. There is evidence within the global genome that honeybees have experienced profound population collapse several times each time bouncing back. The study also observed that small errors in DNA transcription happen very frequently. These spread rapidly between colonies in the same population. The effective population size necessary to explain the genetic findings of the study put the effective population size of the European honeybee at about 200,000 colonies. In other words, in their natural state, honeybee colonies are highly permeable to prevailing gene flows. Whilst honeybees have adapted to diverse setbacks over millions of years, one must surely wonder how resilient they will prove to be in the face of relentless anthropogenic challenge. Most notably, can we really expect them to rapidly adapt to toxic synthetic chemicals used as pesticides or to unprecedented changes in flora? So, to recap, here are some of the genetic insights of recent years that help us to understand how and why Mendel, none other than the father of genetics, failed to improve his honeybees. Firstly, the honeybee traits that interest us are based upon the interplay of multiple genes. Secondly, the traits that concern us are expressed at colony level rather than that of the individual honeybee. Thirdly, the honeybee goes to greater lengths than any other terrestrial animal to mix up its DNA and share successful genetic material within its local population. Fourthly, the worker bees in any colony share one mother but have one of several possible fathers. This dramatically increases genetic diversity, which is the antithesis of what bee improvers try to achieve. Fifthly, there is very considerable evidence for a genetic basis to local adaptation in honeybees. Next, a colony that has been genetically optimised for your locality might fare very poorly indeed just a few hundred miles away. Exotic stock will almost certainly bring in a lot of genetic material that is maladaptive to your apiary environment. Selection pressures are unavoidable and ever-present. Some of the most important selection pressures are a direct consequence of the activities that you choose to perform or omit as a beekeeper. You are a key determiner in the quality of your stock.
In the absence of supportive human intervention, colonies expressing beneficial alleles fare better than those expressing maladaptive alleles, and over successive generations, the expression of such alleles increases in the population. However, what counts as beneficial or maladaptive depends upon the prevailing environmental conditions. Honeybees have a genetic legacy that they can exploit if it helps them respond to new challenges. Honeybee populations have probably been decimated many times in the past, but they have had the resilience to bounce back. However, the challenges faced by honeybees in the Anthropocene are immense and without precedent. I hope that you have found this a useful introduction to some important contemporary insights into honeybee genetics. You now have all the background information necessary to fully engage with my next presentation, which examines four completely incompatible approaches to bee improvement. I believe it is of the utmost importance for every beekeeper to understand each of them so that they can work out for themselves what is best for the honeybees and what is ultimately best for mankind.